You feel like this tightening in your chest when you have to think about all these things, like, I don't know, things that you had never thought about. Meet Louisa. She's in her mid-40s and, until recently, was living in a small rental apartment with her partner and two teenagers. I have one who is graduating high school this year. The other one is younger. They weren't struggling to get by, but they also weren't living in luxury. Then two things happened. The first, a huge loss. Luisa's mother passed away after a long illness. The second, a total surprise. Luisa learned her mother had left her an inheritance worth millions of dollars in property, cash, and investments. So there were all these like little accounts, varying sizes all over the place. It was really hard to manage. I mean, it was definitely more money than I had ever experienced either growing up or as an adult myself. After her mom passed away, Luisa had to camp out at her mom's house, waiting for the mail to arrive, just so she could find out where all the accounts were and how much they held. The amounts were shocking to her because all her life, money had always been tight. Growing up, it was difficult. There were some issues in the family. Parents filed for bankruptcy. Then they divorced, and my mom continued her career. She was a teacher. And yeah, after kind of restabilizing everything, managed to go back to school, get a better degree. She had a good job as a teacher and was then slowly able to build up her, I guess, financial portfolio, let's say, although it was never really discussed at home. She had no idea that in the years since, her mother had saved and invested so well that she was sitting quite comfortably. It was just surprising knowing just growing up some things, I I guess this is kind of personal, but, you know, things that I'm like, well, why did we have to live through that when there was really all of this accumulating on the side? You know, like we couldn't have fixed that in our house or we couldn't have done just not huge things, but some things that I would have considered or that I do consider basic. And I guess just for me, the hardest part was the not having discussed any of that, that money wasn't something that was discussed in the family. Because they didn't talk about money, Louisa now has a sizable sum she doesn't know how to manage. I'm Jamie Rowe, and welcome to What Should I Do With My Money, an original podcast from Morgan Stanley. We match real people asking real questions about their money with experienced financial advisors. Here at Morgan Stanley, we work with a range of clients. Some are experienced investors. Others are new to working with a financial advisor. On this show, you get a front row seat to hear what these initial conversations are like and get answers to some of the questions you might have yourself. Luisa's inheritance has raised many questions for her. Things like, what are her choices if she decides to get a new house? What should she do with her mom's retirement condo? Can she switch her mom's investments to more ethical ones? And will those pay off? And what else does she need to think about that she doesn't even know to ask? Joining us today to help answer those questions is Seth, a financial advisor from our Boston office. Seth is a vice president of wealth management and a senior portfolio manager. But long before he became a financial advisor, Seth was an elite athlete. Seth had trained for the 1996 Olympic decathlon team and even became a fitness instructor. That career started by chance when one day his gym asked him if he could take over someone else's class. And I said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And I watched some videos that night and then I went in and I taught the class. Seth was teaching a women's kickboxing class three days a week for six months. And these women, they changed. It was unbelievable, the change that they went through. And it sort of reinforced for me how much effect I could have in something that I really felt strongly about. That experience has stayed with Seth and informed his work in the mortgage industry as a business owner of several national gym franchises throughout his MBA and now as an F.A. 
So just like health, finances is one of those things that a lot of people don't really know that much about necessarily. So if I can make it more manageable for you, and that's sort of my whole spiel, you know, if you will, um, for people, is I want them to understand. I want them to feel empowered. I love that. Okay, it's time to put these two together and find out how Seth can help Louisa work out her finances. All right, Louisa, hi. Hi, nice to meet you. (laughs) Yeah, nice to meet you as well. And let me do begin by acknowledging uh, your loss. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So give me an idea about, you know, maybe the top three things that you have on your mind that uh, seem to have raised the most questions. So I would say definitely how do I deal with those investments that don't fall into line with my, I guess, moral code. Okay. Another question is a house. So how much money do you, you know, if you put down a lot of money, then your mortgage payment Mm -hmm. is extremely low. Sure. Right? Or you decide, you know what? Even though we could, we're not going to, and we're going to have a larger mortgage, which means higher monthly payments, but then we have that cash available to, I don't know, invest or, you know, do whatever we're going to. So, yeah, that's also a a new one for me, dealing with that decision as well. Okay. So I had one more thing that I was thinking about um, as part of the inheritance is a condo. Okay. Far away from where I live now. At first, I was thinking, I'm just, I'm just going to get rid of it because you know it's just another thing on my plate. We recently visited it once we were finally able to to travel after COVID, and it was like, well, maybe we should keep it. <laughs> but um, yeah, just kind of the, I don't know, implications of owning a property in two different places, and how at what point do you say it's worth it or it isn't worth it to invest the money for the upkeep? And the time, maybe trying to find somebody to rent it and trying to update that. I mean, I feel like there's, you know, once we made the decision to keep it, there were so many variables to it that I was like, well, I don't know. Mm. Should we keep it? So that's another question that I have. Sure. Let's kind of tackle these individually, right? So then the easiest way, I think, that the most logical beginning point would be just the overall inheritance in and of itself. So the beauty of of the inheritance, right, is that you do have a step up in basis with the assets. Seth is explaining a provision in the tax code that allows an adjustment of the cost basis of an inherited asset when it's passed on after death. The term cost basis refers to the original purchase price of an asset for tax purposes. Ordinarily, when you sell an asset, whether a house or a stock, you'd typically be taxed on the gain, the difference between what you paid for it or your cost and what you sold it for. However, when you inherit an appreciated asset, the tax code allows for the raising or stepping up of the cost basis to the fair market value on the deceased individual's date of death. That minimizes the capital gains taxes the heir owes if she sells the asset later. So... There is no capital gain issue to the heirs being you Mm -hmm. on these assets at the moment because of that step up in basis. If you decide to sell the asset later, you may owe capital gains tax on the difference between the sale price for the asset and the stepped up basis. Okay, I didn't know that. Now that Louisa understands that she won't be taxed based on how the value of her inheritance increased over her mom's lifetime, Seth begins tackling one of Louisa's concerns her mom's retirement condo, and if she should sell it or keep it to rent out. If you were to rent it out or if like, say you were to put it on, you know, Airbnb or something like that, Mm -hmm. then you would need to count that income received as earned income to you. Even if I use it, let's say I rent it to somebody for three months of the year Mm -hmm. and over the course of that year, I use it for my personal use for up to a month over that course of the year. Right. But I would still need to declare the the, the rent I receive. You would. As earned income. You would. Okay. Yes, you would. So that might help in some of the decision making around that. Now, you still do have the ability to write off the property tax as a deduction subject to limitations. You would maintain that and you would also be able to write off things that were upkeep. 
So now Seth explains how the tax treatment for a rental property is different than one that's for personal use. While you typically can't deduct repairs and improvements to homes that are for personal use, there may be opportunities to deduct repairs or depreciate the cost of improvements over time for rental properties. Since there may be considerations specific to the state you live in, Seth suggested that Louisa discuss these things with her accountant. If we do any improvements, so which it does need, which are upcoming, as long as I have all the bills for that, then I can also submit that to the accountant and that would also be considered, uh, it could be, I, I don't know, written off or whatever, somehow it's tax relevant information. Right. So generally expenses for repairing or maintaining your rental property may be deductible. This is something you should discuss with your accountant, of course. Oh, awesome. Okay. At this point, Seth brings up a new but important issue, end-of-life planning. Now, this can be a difficult and emotional topic. It's very common for people like Louisa's mother to put off thinking about it, meaning that loved ones like Louisa have a lot to sort out on their own. But financial advisors encounter this situation with many clients and know how to help them through it. As part of that, Seth wants Louisa to start thinking now about her own end-of-life plan. That includes estate planning and trusts. Have you thought at all about a trust, any sort of trust that you would incorporate to protect the assets or help direct them? Does that mean that you have somebody in place to manage the, like the inheritance if the child is still under a certain age? At the time, is that what you mean? So a trust can direct assets for the benefit of a child, regardless of the child's age. Mm -hmm. Working with a lawyer, and you put that language in, and you can devise it however you like. The idea behind the trust, basically, is to protect the flow of assets. So I'll give you an example, an extreme example, albeit, but it's an example. You and your partner have been married for more than 20 years, and you pass away then your partner is now left with the inheritance that you received. They remarry, and then they pass away. Now the person that they remarried, they now have control over the assets. How they direct them would really be up to them, unless there was a trust or a director from a will involved around those assets. So that would be something that could be or should be included to say that inheritance should, of course, go to to my children, to my mother's right. grandchildren, to whom the, you know, the inheritance was originally meant for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So trusts can be used in that way, you know, to protect those assets. So that's something that you, you know, that's something that you should really think about. And that is, you know, that's part of that end of life planning piece. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Now it's time to dig into Louise's question of whether to get a mortgage or not. Louisa can afford to buy a house and afford to buy a house outright, but she's wondering if that makes sense and not have to worry about a monthly payment or if she should get a mortgage and invest the rest of her money elsewhere. Making a decision to have a mortgage is where you're going to leverage your money best. Is it best leveraged in real estate? Do you think that real estate is going to do better than the stock market over the next five or 10 years? Not that you can predict the future, but, you know, this is a, a home that we plan to have for many years. Like we, you know, that's it. We plan to like stay here long term. Right. So, you know, even if the value goes up, whatever goes up in, in five years, 10 years, whatever, that wouldn't help us until we sold it. Right. Exactly. Plus, you may be able to write off the mortgage interest for up to a certain amount of indebtedness, depending on your situation as a deduction, mm -hmm. as well as throughout the lifetime of owning the home. That's a potential offset to your taxes every year. In your situation, my suggestion would be to go with the mortgage option and invest that capital into the market. Okay, so taking a mortgage is definitely, or is, you know, for most, for most people, preferable. Yes. Um, to buying a house outright, yes. even if technically you could. Right, exactly, exactly. Ultimately, Louise's decision will depend on the factors Seth mentioned, plus others like mortgage rates and her expectations for returns if she invested the cash elsewhere, particularly if markets are volatile. Speaking of markets, now we'll turn to Louise's concerns about her mother's investments. Here's how she explained it. 
I mean, that's it's hard to say, right, to, to second guess somebody and, and why they made decisions when they made them. You know, so some of the investments that she had, for me now, I was not comfortable with them. You know, when you have a moral dilemma, you know, and how do you reconcile that and how do you step away from that if you want to step away from that? If I switch to stocks and companies that are more aligned with how I'm morally and ethically comfortable, can I still you know, build my portfolio and make money on those in order to pass down to my kids, but feeling like, you know, okay, we've, you know, I've made some money for you, but I've done it in a way that more aligns with our family's current thoughts and values. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, the great news about that is that generally historical data shows that indices that do incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors, you know, so ESG-oriented investments, they've generally performed in line with or even better than conventional indices. So in other words, yeah, it's possible to do well by doing good. Morgan Stanley has a tool that we call Impact Quotient, or MSIQ, and it helps people align their portfolios with their personal values. So First, it asks you questions to help us identify the values that are important to you and the impact that you hope to make with your investments. Then it analyzes your portfolio to assess how it aligns with the values that you've identified previously. And then finally, it helps us work together to suggest ways to enhance your portfolio's alignment with these suggested preferences of yours. Okay, that's good to know. And how does a company who determines what is qualified as an ESG? What are like the determinants of that? This is a great question. The fact is that there are lots of firms and advisors that struggle with this because there really haven't been any consistent methods developed yet for determining if an investment can meet ESG criteria. So it can be hard for an investor to find the right information. We do have a team that does due diligence across the multitudes of ESG factors before we decide on which investment options are to be considered for our platform. Okay, that's really good to know. Well, listen, hopefully I've addressed the majority of the concerns and challenges that you were talking about when we first started talking? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's um, really definitely like put me at ease about some things for sure. Thank you so much. Good. Great. No problem. I mean, that that is the goal. Now that Seth and Louisa have finished their session, I want to find out from Louisa how it all went for her. Louisa, what was your reaction to the information you got from Seth today? You certainly covered a ton of ground. Yeah, it was really good. You feel it a little bit in the body, right? You feel like this tightening in your chest when you have to think about all these things, like these, I don't know, things that you had never thought about Mm -hmm. and the, the names of forms and the names of different kinds of stocks. And it's a little bit scary. But then speaking to Seth, then, you know, you're able to be like, okay, somebody who is in the know can really break it down very simply so that you know, so that I could understand things. I have more information now, more knowledge, so I can make better, more informed decisions. So I feel much better now. Was there anything surprising or really helpful about what Seth told you today? I think just the knowledge that investing in stocks that are more ethically aligned with with my values is not a bad investment. Like that is actually an investment that I could make and feel good about. So that makes me feel better. So I was happy to hear that. For sure. And anything else? Definitely about the trust. Like, you know, I I hadn't really thought about that rather frightening scenario of, (laughs) you know, I pass away, my partner then goes on to have another relationship. That's not the scary part. I wouldn't hope for anyone to just, you know, be in like a whole, you know, life of mourning (laughs) or anything. But then that when my partner passed away, if there was no trust set up, that that money would go perhaps to my partner's new family and not to my mother's grandchildren as had been intended. So the idea of setting up a trust just to make sure that that money is going where it's quote unquote supposed to go. So that was really important to me to know that. Sure. A super extreme example, but a good argument for having a plan. Yeah. And it could happen, right? What's the first thing you think you're going to do? 
Uh, look for a lawyer to make a will. Mm. That is definitely something that has really been on top of my mind. And now I feel like I have more information and more ideas that I could bring to the table when I do find somebody to say, you know, this is also something that I'm interested in. So let's, let's have this conversation as well. Fantastic. Well, Louisa, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you found it helpful and please keep in touch and let us know how things are going. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Jamie. And especially thank you to Seth for all the information. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Our pleasure. That's it for this episode of What Should I Do With My Money? An original podcast from Morgan Stanley. If you enjoyed the show, follow us wherever you listen to your favorite shows. And if you would like a deeper dive on what was discussed today, come see us at morganstanley.com slash my money. I'm Jamie Rowe. Talk to you soon. This material has been prepared for educational purposes only. It does not provide individually tailored investment advice. It has been prepared without regard to the individual financial circumstances and objectives of persons who receive it. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC recommends that investors independently evaluate particular investments and strategies and encourages investors to seek the advice of a Morgan Stanley financial advisor. The appropriateness of a particular investment or strategy will depend on an investor's individual circumstances and objectives. Tax laws are complex and subject to change. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC, its affiliates, financial advisors, and private wealth advisors do not provide tax or legal advice. Clients should consult their tax advisor for matters involving taxation and tax planning, and their attorney for matters involving trust and estate planning and other legal matters. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC does not accept appointments, nor will it act as a trustee, but it will provide access to trust services through an appropriate third-party corporate trustee. The returns on a portfolio consisting primarily of environmental, social, and governments, ESG, aware investments, may be lower or higher than a portfolio that is more diversified or where decisions are based solely on investment considerations. Because ESG criteria exclude some investments, investors may not be able to take advantage of the same opportunities or market trends as investors that do not use such criteria. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC is a registered broker-dealer, member SIPC, and not a bank. Where appropriate, Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC has entered into arrangements with banks and other third parties to assist in offering certain banking-related products and services. Investment, insurance, and annuity products offered through Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC are not FDIC insured, may lose value, not bank guaranteed, not a bank deposit, not insured by any federal government agency.